Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. Where we're joined by Michael Albergo, and we'll be talking about four papers. This first two stochastic interpolance papers, and then using stochastic interpolance in this framework uh, for data dependent priors and for multi marginal problems. Perfect. Okay. So before I go any further, just, just thanks to my collaborators. Um, you know, there's many people who have been involved in shaping this work, but the, the, the primary folks are Nick and Eric, um, Michael Lindsay, and uh, Mark and Rajesh over here in the bottom left. So this agenda is a little bit old, but the idea is just generally talking about density estimation and sampling with transport maps, you know, motivating the flow-based picture of doing this. And what is the best way to learn expressive and scalable maps and sort of a pitch that if we take inspiration from score-based diffusion in terms of how they choose a path in the space of measures and say, we're just going to regress on that path, this opens up a paradigm for more efficient learning algorithms for learning dynamical transport. So uh, I'll make the pitch about the stochastic interpolants, and then we can talk about some of the more recent work. Okay, just to set up some notation, the problem setup is, you know, given some... Uh, probability density function that I'll call row one, we either have sample data from this or query access to the unnormalized log likelihood row one. Our goal is to estimate this um, likelihood and to be able to sample underneath it. So this paradigm has been very successful in the past 10 years. You know, we've gone from drawing tiny MNIST digits to being able to query uh, these, you know, text to image diffusion models, the bears being chemists, uh, in a cartoonish fashion, and, and you'll get a, a sample image that looks exactly like that. The underlying idea behind all this in the recent success, though, is this measure transport perspective. Okay, we have some density, we endow some sort of parametric transformation of samples to those densities to sample under a new density, given some uh, conservation laws. So th with this transport framework, will be put in the language of having some base density, row zero. Can you see my mouse or no? Yep. Cool. We'll have some base density row zero, and our goal is going to be able to build a, a parametric reversible map T such that when we apply the push forward of T onto this base density row zero, we're going to get the target density row one. Okay. And if we do this uh, in this in this fashion under the right invertibility conditions, et cetera, we can actually compute the likelihood of row one using this sort of push forward and the change of variables given by the determinant of the Jacobian of the map. So of course we don't have T a priori. What we need to do is parameterize it in some clever way, but if we wanna use this for various tasks, we need this determinant to be tractable in the change of measure, but we also need T to be a maximally unconstrained parametric representation to fulfill complicated tasks. So there's a trade-off here in trying to design these maps. You know, quick history, uh, this this idea has its sort of history and some work from uh, Chen and Gopinath in, in 2000 on their paper the Gaussianization, and then Eric and his collaborator Esteban Tubak and Esteban, Eric, and uh, Christina Turner had this work where they sort of said, what's one way to learn this map given these types of constraints? Let's do it sequentially with little transformations TK, stack them together, and under some maximum entropy perspective or such, we can learn uh, to, to push forward samples like this. And then the neural network folks came on and Laurent Din and Danilo Rosende and George Papa Macarius and folks said, well, what if these little transformations are actually parameterized by invertible neural networks? And in that case, you know, this opened the door to sort of building the deep learning version of this. And if you take the K equals infinity limit here, we can sort of think of this as a T being the solution of a continuous time flow. In that case, this determinant is now replaced with a trace of the instantaneous change of measure okay, given by uh, uh, in instantaneous change of uh, uh, position for, for any sample here given by a velocity field B. So B is going to be important notation going forward that is actually a little bit more efficiently estimable and now works with the paradigm of neural ODEs. So this is the slide where I'm going to start introducing the notation we use for the rest of the talk. Um, we're going to have this flow map that's going to be capital X at time T that is endowed by some velocity field BTX which is such that at time t equals zero, this flow map for any sample x evaluates directly to x. You know, that's our initial condition under row zero. And then the time dynamics of this map are given by the velocity field evaluated at that point. 
So what this is telling us is that any point on this flow, the, the you know instantaneous push push forward here is going to be given by uh, this velocity field. So that's what's happening at the level of the samples. At the level of a distribution, right? We're going to ask how does rho t x evolve, which is some time dependent density that moves between rho zero and rho one. What we need is this rho t x to satisfy some transport equation or continuity equation that is such that at time t equals zero, this time dependent density evaluates to the base density rho zero, and at time t equals one, it evaluates to our target density. And so if that's the case, P, rho t satisfies this transport equation, and we have that at time t equals one, we've reached our target. And so the premise here is that Benoit Brenier theory says this BTX is, is guaranteed to exist under some, some pretty um, uh, light conditions on you know, the Lipschitz constant of this, this map. And our goal is then to find a BTX that does this push forward for us. Okay, this is what the generative modeling paradigm is going to be. So I'll skip over this. We know that there are KL divergence-based ways of training these maps, but they're expensive and costly because you have to backpropagate either through your ODE solve or I need to use some a joint method to do this with um, fixed memory. So we don't want to do that. And we're going to ask ourselves, how can we work exactly on this time interval, t equals zero, one, with an arbitrary row zero and an arbitrary row one and build a connection between them? So our pitch is that there's a paradigm that sort of tucks all this neatly together that we call stochastic interpolants, which relies on this object that I'll call an interpolant function, okay? The interpolant function i is a function of x0, x1, and time, and just has to have the boundary conditions that at time t equals 0, the interpolant evaluates to x0, and at time t equal 1, it evaluates to x1. So a very simple example is just i of t x0, x1 is 1 minus t x0 plus t x1, OK? Then the question is, how do you sample x0 and x1? Well, you could do this totally randomly. You could draw x0 and x1. You know, We know it needs to be from some joint density, rho 0, uh, rho x0 and x1. And if we do this, OK, i of t is actually a stochastic process, which samples in law some other time-dependent density, rho t x, okay? So we get samples x t by drawing an x0 and an x1 from some joint dex density, rho x0, x1. We put that into the interpolant, and that gives us a sample for any time between this interval. So in this little drawing, you know, we have a time t equals 0, a single-mode Gaussian, and a time t equal 1, a three-mode Gaussian mixture, and we can sort of interpolate directly between that to produce samples in that interval, okay? Now, you know, we can represent this interpolant density pretty straightforwardly as an expectation over this base density. A trivial choice for the joint rho x0, x1 is just the independent coupling, rho 0, x0 plus uh, times rho 1, x1. Okay. That's sort of how we initially pitched this, but there was some interesting recent work by uh, or Alex Pulidon Pouli, uh, and company and Alex Tong that sort of asks, okay, are there more complicated couplings that you could choose that do something here? But the idea is this gives you a way to sample this time-dependent density. But in the okay. in the original stochastic interpolants work, you already show that um, my joint here can be anything and it doesn't have to um, to be independent. Yeah, exactly. Um, we didn't give any interesting examples of some. I would say um, Alex and our Raman folks gave an interesting example with this mini batch OT coupling. Um, yeah. But I'll talk about later that many of these couplings are, are naturally available uh, depending on the task that you want. But if our goal, you know, is to just um, regress some velocity field here, right? We know there's a velocity field that connects these two densities. We don't know what it is. Our goal would be to set up some minimization problem that says, you know, I have a model B hat. I want B to be equal to B hat everywhere. Can I do this minimization? My two challenges are, I don't know what the target B is, and I don't know how to sample this uh, time-dependent density on the interval to evaluate this loss. So, okay, the interpolant, in its first look, gives you a way to sample any time-dependent density that makes this connection. So there's one thing that we have. And then the question is, 
Well, let me make a, a statement about this first. Okay, we have these samples XT from row T, okay? What is the target BTX, right? We don't, we know, we've written down some way to sample the, the, the density which satisfies this continuity equation, but we actually don't know what B is in this continuity equation. So uh, I'll just state what it is for sake of being brief. You can prove it with a characteristic function or, or just taking the time derivative of this continuity uh, of this time dependent density. Um, but this, this velocity field is actually now given directly in terms of the time dynamics of this interpolant. So it's just given by the conditional expectation of the time derivative of I given that xt equals x, okay? So that gives us a form for what bt is, right? We still don't know how to uh, evaluate this conditional expectation, right? So we're getting closer to a loss function that is actually pragmatic here, right? We still, um, you know, we now have a, a, an object to put here, but we don't know how to exactly evaluate that loss at that point. So there's one simple observation to make. Our goal is to do this regression loss. We can now plug in this conditional expectation, which is the exact value for uh, the analytic form for B. And we can just use this simple identity that says any integration over the conditional expectation of a function of x0, x1 in time integrated with respect to the time dependent density uh, this conditional expectation is actually then just given by the expectation over uh, the, the coupling of uh, row zero, row x zero, x one, which in this case, if I just take the independent coupling, just means taking the conditional expectation of this time dependent interpolant over the two marginal densities. Okay, so this is the crux with... of what makes this. Yeah. Can you go a slide back? Yep. Uh... So we have this BT is given by this conditional expectation. Okay, and then on your next slide, where does your integral come from? Uh, which integral? This integral? integral? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, the, so um, I, sorry, I think I, I went a little quick here. We have this loss function, which is over time and space. Right, mm -hmm. and I don't know what B is, but I just uh, stated in that theorem on the previous slide that B is given by this conditional expectation. Right, yeah. so now I just explicitly wrote out this time derivative, uh, time integral. I mean, space integral. Sorry, so I put the time integral here. There was oh. always a space okay. integral here, but I was oh, yeah. trying to just be brief for notational purposes. Okay, but I put it here to be like, we know actually something about this type of integration. You know, uh, we can take integrals of these types of conditional expectations uh, quite nicely just by taking the expectation over the, the marginal densities. Or more generally, this is any coupling between the two marginals. But if that's the case, then we can take this loss function and just plug in directly the time derivative for the interpolant and now just take the expectation over row zero and row one. So now it's just this quadratic regression for the velocity field in terms of our model and the time derivative of the interpolant. So the analytic thing is totally gone and we just have to solve this simple quadratic regression problem, which you know is only about three or four lines of, of PyTorch code. Um, so it gives sort of a straightforward means of, of doing this type of, this type of learning. Uh, can I ask a question? So- About the previous- Yes, slide. please. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's also okay about the um that green box down there. Um, could you please linger on that a little more? What does it mean to regress b against the time derivative of i? Is there an intuitive way to understand that? Yeah, I mean, maybe I, it it should hopefully follow uh, logically from just looking at the top equation here, which is this is our dream, right? We know that there's some row tx that satisfies this transport. We know that there's an associated b, right, that we need here in this continuity equation, right? And this guy is gonna be our generative model ultimately. And, but we don't know anything about how to evaluate b or sample rho. So that you introduce the interpolant, you say, okay, this gives me a way to sample rho because uh, that's the point of this right here right, that sampling x0 and sampling x1, either from a joint density or, oh, go ahead, Hans, sorry. When you're, when you're here, 
So I, I think maybe the question is a little bit about uh, what does it mean to regress against the time derivative of i? And for that, maybe it is, uh, it's useful to look at your example here of what i is and what the time derivative of it mm -hmm. then would be. And then we plug in a little delta t and then uh, we know what we concretely uh, regress, regress on. Right. So here, for example, I, I take this linear interpolant. This is just one minus t x zero plus t x one. The time derivative of this is x one minus x zero. Right. This yeah. take time derivative here. Take time derivative here. You get x one minus x zero. So you take that, and you just plug it in here. And this will give you. So so the process i right is going to give you some rho t x right. That sample it samples rho tx in law. And that's different than a generative model that says, I have an initial condition x0, and now I want to push it forward with this velocity field using the probability flow ODE I wrote on this slide right here. So there's this mm -hmm. equation that I want to use BTX to use as a generative model. All I want is a way to sample this so that I can learn this and then use it as a generative model. The law of the interpolant is going to be different than what the push forward does to any x0. But it just gives me a way to write down a regression problem for learning the b that solves the transport. Does that clarify? Let me know if it doesn't, because there's something I'm not saying clearly. Then. Um, I think it's all right. Yeah, thank you. So here in this okay. L, L of b hat, we would have um, for the time derivative of i, this would just be x1 minus x0 if we look at the uh, example yes. you know, showed for stochastic interpolant. Good. Yeah, exactly. We like to write this generally, though, because there are some nice things you could say if i is, for example, a nonlinear function or you know some other sort of unexplored uh, aspect. But in general, yes, it can be, it can be very straightforward. All right. OK, right. So just a quick comment on this. Row 0 and row 1, are uh, we have direct access to from samples. So this loss you can directly estimate gives us a generative model between either of the densities, because this transport is invertible. Um, and you can get the likelihood out of this. You might ask if we have these sorts of divergence metrics that we can say give us nice things about the convergence and KL, for example, between our model and the target, you can bound dynamical transport losses like this with the Wasserstein uh, uh, via uh, Gronwall's trick that uh, gives you a bound on uh, this loss with respect to the Wasserstein 2 distance. So W2 is always going to be um, bounded by this loss. Can you say something yep. about uniqueness? Um, if, we per if we solve the, your L, What's the is the B hat unique? Uh, I mean, so unique you want to choose all. ideally that it be the gradient of some convex potential, um, in general to say like you have the uniquely optimal version of this. But for for any it, this gives a there's only one bt that does the trick. Yeah, but can you give a little bit of reasoning why this is the case, and does it come from the continuity equation? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just more of a statement that there's this density in law, right? And so there is for any ODE, you know, a one velocity field that does that, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so yes, just doing this in practice, you can do this on these image problems. It scales pretty well to high resolution. Um, we have some more results in that recently, but I'm sure you've seen the, the works of Ricky Chen and Yaron Lipman that fulfill the same paradigm. Um, then they show some really awesome results. Uh, okay, but then uh, maybe the point here is that there's more you can say about this. Uh, you don't need to just define flows with the interpolant. You can also define um, diffusions governed by some sort of stochastic dynamics. And I, will, I only bring this up to ask, you know, are there trade-offs between using a generative model that's deterministic or one that's stochastic? 
So the simple trick is just to say, take my interpolant as I had it before, put on here some additional latent variable Z, okay, which is sampled from a Gaussian and is uh, scaled by some gamma T such that at time T equals zero and at time T equals one, gamma is zero. And in between it's some positive function. This one I chose was T one minus T square rooted. Cause this has some nice correspondence with the Brownian bridge. Um, so, you know, if X zero and X one were not Gaussian and there were some complicated densities, you wouldn't have the score a priori. Um, but if you introduce this as a way to say, actually, I can write down what the score of this time dependent density is um, by just simple extension of the previous BTX. Now it's defined by the conditional expectation of DTIT plus the time derivative of gamma TZ given X T equals X. Moreover, uh, the score of this time dependent density is now actually just given by uh, one over uh, gamma t times the conditional expectation of just z given x equals x. So this has a very straightforward loss as well. The paradigm is, is generally going to be we introduce a conditional expectation, which gives us a very simple quadratic loss. Okay? So you have a model s hat for t now. You have a gamma, uh, gamma t times z times the model itself, and this is your loss for for those uh, time dependent. Uh, okay. That's what can you do with some, it? Oh, good. Some some comparisons here at this point to or to make some connections to other works. Um, why is it here that my gamma or the, the noise needs to be zero at the at the endpoints? If I understand correctly, this is not the case for uh, the formulation of the flows of. Um, Alexander Tong's paper, for example, is improving and generalizing flow flow and score models or something like that. And there, for example, he just has a constant uh, constant sigma that he always uh, adds no matter where you are along your in interpolation. So um, to satisfy the continuity equation, or the associated Fokker Planck equation, if you integrate with an SD, you have to guarantee that you end up at the target density, right? So you can always introduce a bias that is maybe better for learning a little bit. Um, for example, if we look at this loss function down here, if because I'm enforce, enforcing that gamma t goes to zero at t equals one and t equals zero, this guy at times very close to t equals one t equals zero is going to blow up, right? Because it's one over gamma. Yeah. Now you can, you, with some antithetic sampling trips, you can get uh, tricks. You can guarantee that you know there'll be finite variance on this estimator. But the point uh, there is that you might actually want to not go totally to remove gamma t, but maybe have it end at a fixed value sigma. You know, that's like very small because then this term is a little bit more well-behaved. But technically, the time-dependent density does not actually arrive at the true target if you, do not, if you don't remove the gamma. So it's more like okay. a trick that people do that's a little pragmatic. Wait, There's so another point, though, which right, is... What's, okay. what they, more or less, what's happening in, um, in the Tong paper is that we we don't learn the score um, additionally. We just learn uh, learn a B, but we still sample from your stochastic interpolant. And um, now why do, like, we don't actually need the score, right? If we just want the ODE. Um, for totally. and, and if we just have the ODE, can we, or does that then, like somehow enable us to, um, not have this boundary condition on the gamma? It doesn't. So you you always still need to arrive at your target density. So even if you're using the ODE, you still have to get there and you have to land there. So you, put another way, XT at time T equals one needs to be a sample from row one. Now, if you've convolved your target with some Gaussian value, um, even if you're still just using the velocity field without um, learning the score, because you can still just learn this big guy, <clears throat> then you still won't arrive at the, tri the, the perfectly true target density. You can introduce this bias. I mean, Ricky and Yaron do it in their initial paper, even um, 
because it I think pragmatically helps them with the experiments. I, don't, I can't speak for them, but I think that's okay. my understanding of it. Okay. Uh, but it's not exact for scientific applications. Uh, okay. And then why? But, but maybe a, a, a. Why do you want to learn your score here as well? Well, I'll get to that in one sec. Okay. Because there there's some pragmatic aspects to it. Um, well, two points. One is. Ultimately, you don't need this factor dt gamma t to be in your loss. Instead, you could just learn this conditional expectation, expectation of z given x equals x. In this case, that also falls out of this loss function. And now this thing is perfectly well-defined, very smooth, right? because now there's no term in here that's going to blow up. This would be the uh, equivalent to learning a denoiser, right? instead of learning the score function entirely. So that would make more connections with like a DDPM and stuff like that. So you can write down a valid, you know, OD integrator that just relies on this guy. In fact, imagine one of your base densities is a Gaussian. Then you don't need this term at all, right? You can still write down the score and you can still just learn just this conditional expectation to do your entire sampling. Moreover, then with this guy, you can use an OD or an SD to sample. So let me just clarify, why would you want to do that? Okay, the score allows us to, like in the case of diffusion, now define a gendered model on stochastic dynamics that has a tunable diffusivity, okay? The stochastic dynamics are going to have this additional term epsilon, right? And we can do this now between any two densities. If you want to use the ODE, you just need a model for B, right? If you want to use the SDE, okay, then the generative model is given now by this dynamics here, the stochastic differential equation, where we have some BF, where BF is B plus or minus epsilon times S, and this guy here is some uh, Brownian motion. The benefit of the SDE, at least theoretically, is the, is the following, you know, is there a trade-off between doing the OD or doing the SD? It turns out, and you can uh, email Nick Boffy about this if you have more questions, he had this nice idea, that if you wanted to bound the KL divergence between your models push forward, right? You have some B hat that when evolved gives you some rho hat TX and the true push forward for whatever you chose as your interpolant, then it turns out that if you do this with the ODE, matching the Bs does not actually bound the KL because the Fisher divergence is still un uncontrolled by small er error in B hat minus B. So this term pops up. If, however, B hat is the density pushed by estimated stochastic dynamics, so BF is now equal to you know, B hat plus epsilon S hat, it should have a hat as well. Um, then it turns out this is actually sufficient to bound the KL. So in some sense, you know, you might argue this is this is a nice feature. Um, pragmatically, I would say integrating the SD is actually harder to do numerically and much more costly. So this may not be a meaningful trade-off for, for a practitioner, but at least it's a nice thing. Okay, but you actually can then say, is there an optimal epsilon, right? in this diffusivity of the stochastic dynamics, um, it, it turns out there is. I mean, practically computing it is not so easy because it assumes you can access the minimizer of your loss function. But you can at least, you know, for example, in, in the case of Gaussian mixtures, we can write down exactly what the, you know, the velocity B and what the score are at all times between two Gaussian mixtures. <laughs> and then you could say, I'm gonna try to learn those and compare directly to what the true uh, time dependent density should give me there. And you, you can actually see that uh, there actually, there is a value of epsilon, which gives you a lower KL divergence than, uh, than epsilon equals zero. And then of course, the, if you increase it too high, you actually get worse. So there's some sweet spot in the stochastic dynamics here that allows you to do a little bit better. <clears throat> but our, this does not necessarily generalize to things that are very high dimensional like images because the, tr the costs of actually solving it at least to me, does just a little too high. Um, but let me show you some examples of that now. 
So why, why do we want even want this interpolant paradigm? What is this allowing us to do? Well, you know, one is actually free to construct a variety of them. You just have to follow these simple rules. The boundary conditions that you asked about, Hans, have to have to be met. And if you want to use the SD, then the score is available when either row zero or row one is in the exponential family. So it doesn't have to be a Gaussian, but we've been talking about it being a Gaussian. So you either need that or you need to introduce this gamma TZ, right? Which is some convolving it essentially with a Gaussian in the intermediate space, which may help. So some, some examples. This will be, we're gonna update the longer paper that I think you linked to uh, in broadcast in the Sans uh, with some, some new results for what we submitted to the journal. Uh, you can take, for example, what we call a mirror interpolant. So this mirror interpolant is some XT that's equal to X1 with no coefficient plus gamma TZ, okay? So this is basically saying uh, at any time XT is has knowledge of X1, we introduce some Gaussian latent variable as we go through time for rho Tx, and then we remove it again. It actually turns out in this case, Vtx is entirely defined just by the score function. And you could take example images that you have and integrate with the SDE to get an a proximal image basically from your original one. So this is a different form of generation that doesn't rely on taking a Gaussian and pushing it forward to sample, but it's learning a map from row one back to itself. So for a single point from row one, you could generate the entire density again, for example. Okay. The most common application, you know, is this one-sided interpolant that where people take a Gaussian and they want to push forward to get some sort of new sample. So what happens if you do this with varying the epsilon in the, in the SDE? Okay, well, first you get some, you know, here's doing this on these 128 by 128 flower images. I generated two lily looking, lily pad looking objects. Um, if I take the same Gaussian noise, I push forward again with epsilon equals 1.0, I get a different set of flowers. If I push forward with epsilon equals 2.0, I get a different set of flowers. By the time I push forward with epsilon equals 4.0, the flowers are, are basically totally moved on from what the original premise image looked like. So you can explore, you know, different uh, possible proximal and, and farther away samples in generation by introducing the SDE. The problem is this gets very expensive. So in, uh, you know, you can use the adaptive solvers, et cetera, to, to solve this uh, ODE, which is the epsilon equals zero case. But then the number of steps you need to solve the SDE grows. And I, I personally don't think this is super practical, but people might have more clever integrators or ways to do this that, that are a little bit better. Okay, and then just, you know, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll talk about two new papers, which are basically trying to exploit the fact that uh, we don't have to take this independent coupling and we don't have to think just about two marginals. Yeah, before we, get into, before we get into the new stuff, um, can we maybe go mm -hmm. back to the slide where you regress against the score or where you introduce also learning the score? Yes. Da, 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 da. This guy. Yeah. So, right, and we need to be able to evaluate the score. How do we, uh, and you say it is a, we need an exponential family. So what, how restrictive is that really? When can we, when can we additionally learn the score and when can we not? Uh, I would I would say in general the statement should just be about a Gaussian for now. I mean we haven't shown that this in practice can work, so uh, it just maybe mathematically you could say that you only need this to be exponential family, um, but in the practice I would say just it should be a Gaussian. Okay, um, and then maybe yeah maybe I can quickly screen share, da, 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 continue. Mm -hmm. Share and are we already? Yeah, we're already looking at this paper, right? In the this is the Alex Tong's paper here with this improving and generalized mm -hmm. class. And, um, yeah, for example, they have this table here, right? Where they, uh, for example, cite you, uh, um, 
your stochastic interpolants paper and uh, having linear interpolation and always adding like we have where where is it we have a normal as the probability flow yeah this is just uh, sampling noise from a normal and adding it so basically your z but the gamma is just constant and the gamma is just uh, one so to say and so gamma of t so what is here now the comparison to to what you just presented where the gamma needs to be zero uh, at both t equals one and t equals zero well here the gamma is just it just stays constant I would say that this is maybe a misquote. We don't have a a, gamma, a sigma that exists in this intermediary without introducing gamma tz. Um, in the one-sided case, of course, uh, if we had some alpha t x zero plus beta t x one, for or for them, if this is you know one minus t x zero, uh, and x zero is a Gaussian, then you can still access the score. But for us, at the endpoints, there is no sigma. Uh, we remove it entirely by this gamma tz because you otherwise do not end up at the endpoints of your target density. Okay. So you wouldn't actually arrive at the target. But why do now people these... might practice? Yeah, exactly. People might practically <laughs> do this because uh, maybe, for example, the distribution of images is uh, you know kind of like a sum of Dirac's, and you want to smooth it out because the velocity could be better learned in that case. But if, for example, you had a target row one that is some scientifically known, you know, maybe it's the energy distribution or the distribution according to the energy of, of a bunch of uh, configurations of some scientific object like molecules for, you know, some Gibbs distribution or, or, or something like this. This would then not actually be sampling truly under the target. It'd be sampling under the target with some noisy convolution. It's not clear okay. to me uh, that that's always a safe bet. So is it then also, yeah, like I'm I'm not sampling the, so you're saying if I then, uh, if I train with this, I'm not actually sampling the, the target distribution, right? So it's kind of wrong. Yes. Well, I mean, in practice, sigma might be very small. You know, and then uh, it might not matter. I think uh, Yaron and Ricky take a very small value of it at the end of their interpolant. I don't know exactly. But my impression is if you leave it there, you're not sampling from the target density properly. Okay. And then we also have a question in the chat by Jason. Could you repeat why the optimum? Oh, no, we already discussed it. Um... Okay, then what's the what would you say? What is the best paper to read about the trade-off between SDE and ODE? Is it in the stochastic interpolant paper? Um, I think there is some other work where people explore this in diffusions experimentally. So there's that um, well-known elucidating the de design space paper by Taro Karas and folks. Uh, they explore this, I think, in there in some respect. I mean, they don't write it in the same way, but um, I think it's in there. That's probably a good, like one of the best experimental demonstrations of this. I don't recall what, you know, value of the scale of this they found, but I think it's in there. Okay. And then what is the right, because now you have, a, you're also learning the score in addition. And what is, is there now some connection to Schrödinger bridges? And um, if we, let's say we had the optimal coupling, we were training with the optimal coupling between our um, start and end distribution. Uh, yeah, are there some Schrödinger bridge connections? Yeah, there are. So there's two things to say about how you get optimal transport with these this, this paradigm. So. The first is, um, as you say, if you have a coupling between row zero and row one that is already optimal, then indeed, just learning the interpolant by sampling from that coupling using the one minus t x zero plus t um, times the output uh, 
Tx0, where T is the transport that does that coupling, will give you the optimal transport. Okay, and then the other thing you could do is to say, I don't know the coupling, but I can parameterize the interpolant itself. And if I go back to this loss function, and now I is parametric, okay? Oh, but you need to I'm... start screen sharing again. You need to again, start screen sharing again. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, so we're back at this loss function. Now I can ask, what happens if I is some parametric function that always maintains the correct boundary conditions? If I've minimized this loss, okay, and I found a B, this loss is going to evaluate to negative the transport cost of the of the push forward. So we're going to have this is going to look like the Benamou Brenier transport. The minimizer of this guy is negative integral, the norm of the velocity field, taking an expectation over rho tx. So if I then maximize this loss after I've minimized the v, the b, with respect to the interpolant parameters, this will minimize the transport cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, And this is a, another way of getting at the optimal transport. To do this in a very general sense, you'll need i to be a nonlinear function, okay, so that it can um, so the, its uh, interpolant density covers the family of interpolable densities. We discussed this in the two original papers. And now the same goes for the Schrodinger bridge. So if you have the coupling and you do the SD, you're good. If you don't, you can solve a maximum problem that will give you the Schrodinger bridge. In right. practice, we haven't really explored this maximum problem very much. Um, but I'll say something actually about a restricted class of optimization that you could do just over the interpolant in, in linear interpolants alpha, you know, and beta, where we have these uh, one minus t times x zero plus t times x one, for example. If that one minus t and t are parametric, then you can actually say a little bit more about this. Let me just check on the chat real quick. But I think. No, there, mostly just uh, handling it. Um, yeah, the discussion about the SDE versus ODE. Ah, yeah, I've, yeah, it's interesting for sure. I think in practice, uh, uh, people need to come up with good SDE integrators for it to be practical. But let me just now um, go back. Can, can I get a short question for the previous slide you just went at, where they compare the flow and the diffusion one? This one, yeah. Could this... you put that again? Yeah, the, the right hand side. Yeah, I mean, Emil made a comment in the chat about like connection with like the right hand side where we have like the uh, the additional like epsilon term to treat this formula. So you where you basically have your your LE estimate and then you say, okay, I, I correct this Marshall density. Do you have a comment on that? Like how, how you see do you see the connection to trees formula there? Or like how would you how would you compare that? Sorry, are you saying uh, Tweedy's formula or Tree's formula? Tweedy's, where you basically say, okay, you have Tweedies. your, yeah. Yeah, there are connections that can be made in Tweedy's formula. We're going to state them more explicitly in, this week we'll post a completed version that we submitted to the journal of the longer interpolant paper. And basically, because you can connect uh, this score function S, if I actually pull up its loss, this guy, this yeah. expected value of z given x equals x can be used to construct things that are, look like denoisers in general, right? So um, there, there are some explicit things you can say about uh, Tweedy denoising, but of course you cannot use Tweedy denoising as a as a generative model writ large because um, at the you know if if there's no signal, for example, if z is fully Gaussian, right, and we're at time t equals zero or at the Gaussian, there's no signal. And you can't start the Tweedy to Tweedy formula, but you you can use Tweedy denoising, for example, in a, in a valid discretization of the of the ODE if you wanted to. We have, we'll say a little bit about that in the paper. You know, it can in these image experiments improve the FID a little bit, but uh, you know that's a little bit of alchemy. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, then <laughs> yeah. I would say let's get to the new stuff. All right.
Okay, we designed some interpolants. Let's go through that. Right, and you said um, did this. in practice, uh, or would you say in practice you always use the ODE? I personally do. I mean, the ODE can be very efficient in comparison, you know. I mean, it could be 30 or 40 function calls compared to 1,500, you know. It's just good to, uh, it, 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 in practice, it seems quite good. Depends on what your goals are ultimately, right? If your goal is to generate images, it seems like these can do that pretty well with the ODE. If your goal is to do something that's uh, more precise or you have stricter constraints, it might be better to consider the SD if you can come up with a good integrator for it. Wait, isn't, don't we always see if we have these diffusion model papers that if we use the SDE, that the FID is a little bit nicer than when using the ODE? My impression is that that answer is still a little bit up in the air. There's this paper that's by like Karsten Kreis and, and Arash Vodat and folks where they do like serious sweeps over comparing to, comparing to a lot of other uh, systems and their FIDs are pretty much you know, totally within error bars of each other. I think the OE even is even slightly lower. That's the critically damped Langevin paper, I think is what they call it. Okay. But uh, maybe yeah, I would say the... it would be nice if someone did. Go, 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 go,
right? Maybe parts of it are blocked out, but you know what most of the image looks like already. So your base density can be the original image that you had conditioned on some mask filled with Gaussian noise within that mask, okay? So now we have a joint density, which is row one of X1 is still the target images, but the density you start to, from has a lot of structure already built into what the target uh, density is. So row zero X zero is now conditional on X1 in the following way, where I have some mask, which is the C, and then I convolve it with some noise in all areas where that mask is defined. That noise is zeta. And now I can learn by taking a clean image, taking uh, a choice of mask that's randomly uh, generated in, uh, by choosing some patches of the images, filling it with Gaussian noise, and then learning to just do denoising on that, basically. So if you do this over training, you can actually you know, amortize the decorruption. I've randomly um, selected where the masks are. And now, for any masking, if you've successfully found the minimizer of this of this loss, you could take any sort of masking, fill in a uh, and fill in a proper covering of the image. So this is true in distribution. Every time I draw a new noise set, even for the same mask, I should get slightly different outputs. So it's not just about you know regressing uh, on one specific image, but still generating uh, in in sense a distribution. But uh, you also can make this mask invariant, for example, in all the areas that you know will remain constant in the image. So there's some efficiency that you can assign to this. Putting this stuff together allows you to now, for example, just operate directly on 512 by 512 images uh, without needing some sort of latent uh, representation to do this sort of denoising. Another example would be super resolution. So say you know you only have 64 by 64 dimensional images, you could define some procedure uh, where X0 is now conditioned right, on taking X1, having downsampled it, right, and then re-up sampling so it's back in the correct space, for example, 256 by 256, and convolving it with a little bit of noise. That noise again is zeta. So this is building a coupling such that X0 is now very proximal to its intended target the low resolution image is basically baked in to the uh, uh, the prior. And, and this allows then for, so, you know, we intuit a more efficient way of doing this uh, super resolution. But then, you know, we were thinking a little bit more in general about like the, this framework and we, we were sort of asking ourselves. Wait, um, oh, before ahead. we to the multi marginals let's stick with the data stuff a little bit uh, mm -hmm. am i right so my interpretation of this right in your paper um yeah let's maybe just go to your paper do you want to share your paper or should i or also how uh, much sure let me pull it or... i have until twelve thirty, so i can okay. kick it and talk about whatever until twelve thirty. Good, good. Then I'll quickly share my screen and uh, look at the paper here. Perfect. Uh, right, you have this uh, now. Instead of having having a having, for example, this which we are used to that we mm -hmm. have our independent coupling pdf right we additionally let's let's we also have this conditioning this class con or con this conditioning um, but now for example you're saying we can have this sort of uh, data dependent coupling where we sample from our data mm -hmm. and then we sample or the, the prior is defined based on our um the based on our data right and this is then sort yeah. of like uh, we we always for generation if we now want to generate something we need to sample from our data then add a little bit of noise to it and then denoise it so to say okay in the training yes no, uh, well, and it doesn't well, have to be just noise we wrote it in this form where so We've constructed ones here, right? Where these are all Gaussian yeah. is my point, right? Like where 
it, it, that's just to keep in line with the, it doesn't have to be a Gaussian, right? You can have any distribution in that sort of space. Um, but that, now that's just that this is just in training. Okay, why is it only during training? How do I now, how does inference work? So, for example, uh, you could be given an already corrupted image, right? Maybe you have some sort of process that you're dealing with where you're collecting data that is corrupted. Because you've trained in a way where you've taken true clean data, corrupted it, right? Now, when whatever you're given a new sample that has this type of corruption, you can choose to remove it. You also can then introduce, you know, the corruption in some sense for image editing. For example, if this conditional set was clip embeddings for text, right? If Xi was clip embeddings that said, you know, take this image and remove the swing from the back of my kid on at the playground and put like a dinosaur, right? If you remove this the swing and, and in space, you could condition this to generate an image is such that it has the clip embedding of, of what you've read. Um, okay. So there's an image editing in some sense after. But I could also like generate something close by to the data that I already had by sampling from the data um, and then sampling your row zero, which is defined by mm -hmm. the data and then um, denoising it, so to say, All right? Yeah. So. For example, I, and maybe one other example is, I don't know how to phrase this perfectly because I'm not a biologist, but if you had like the backbone of a protein and you knew there are uh, various forms of additional, you know, components that you could append, you could learn by taking complete molecules, right? Masking mm -hmm. out parts of them and adding randomness and learning to, to decorrect, decorrupt this. The, pre the premise here is we know conditioning is like really important for getting good results of these models. You know, a lot of the strength of stable diffusion comes from its powerful conditioning, right? So if there's new ways for us to do that, that allow us to generate in more efficient ways, then, then we want to start thinking about how to phrase those problems. Okay, but then uh, again there, I have a little bit of a question, right? Because here now mm -hmm. don't lose one of the, or don't, yeah, don't we lose one of the strengths that we do have with, Uh, classifier guidance, uh, classifier free guidance, because we were able to learn this additional or to leverage this additional unconditional model. And here we only have a conditional model. So no. maybe let me uh, pull out two different moving parts here. There's conditioning the base density, and then there's put, putting conditional information in the velocity field. Putting the conditional information in the velocity field, like like a xi, is uh, one option, right? And that's like what they do with clip and blah blah blah. And then what they would do is in the classifier free guidance, they would say we're going to train 90% of the time with xi in the velocity field, and then 10% of the time we'll put in this null token, right? That tells us sample unconditionally from the model. It's not associated with the target. That is still a premise that is totally fine to use in this case. The question is really, is there a benefit to constructing the base density in a way that already bakes in some of that information, such that you are free to use any classifier-free guidance you wanted to, depending on how you use Xi. So this was more just to state what the, the what the, the full picture looks like in its complexity, if you wanted Xi in there in, in certain ways. But there's, it's just important to maybe, and we should probably clarify this more carefully in the paper, pull out the differences between couplings between the densities and conditional generation. So the conditional generation is contingent upon this um, inclusion in the, in, the, in the velocity field too. Okay, to me, it seemed like we could also just ignore the whole, uh, whole eta, uh, the whole psi. Uh, throughout the whole paper mm -hmm. and then we have our, we can still have our data dependent coupling and this is a separate point from the you can. class okay you can and, and i you think can. it's a good point we debated it whether or not to phrase it like this but we figured it's probably best to to be totally cohesive um but you're totally right that you know these statements can yeah. be made without it
And the class conditioning is also completely separate from the data dependent coupling stuff, right? Yeah, I'm just sorry. Reading. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's one example of. It's a it's 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 coupling on X one in a slightly different way, right? Yeah, and you're saying now I could you're generating also... a sample conditional on. Yeah. I could also have a, ahead, as one of my possibilities for my XI have a null token and do the classifier free guidance thingy, for example, if I want to do a conditional generation. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, cool. And then for conditional generation or this, this sort of in painting, uh, you're saying maybe we uh, more want to go this route. Uh, where we add, um, where we, oh, yeah, for in painting, right? In your, the in painting example that you show, we kind of use both of them at the same time, where we condition on a mask and then make our uh, base distribution data dependent. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the velocity field gets the mask in addition that says, and this is, this is where. How, for example, Jason could very nicely do some um, scaffold, scaffold in painting for, uh, yeah, generating new, no, no, motif in painting to generate some new scaffolds for that motif. All right, good. Thank you very um, much. Thank I you. think so. Yeah, happy to talk more about that if you want. I don't know enough biology to say exactly I understood what you meant, but, but yes. In premise, I believe that's true. Okay. Yeah. Then let's continue with some multi marginals. Oh, ah, no, no, no. Sorry. W one more. And oh, let's do the multi marginals mm -hmm. first because it's quite on time. Multi marginals. Multi marginal. Okay. Let me reshare. Oh. Okay. The point of the multi-marginal sort of stemmed from the observation that consider the, the following interpolant, okay? I have some xt, right? Which is equal, equal to some alpha zero t x zero plus alpha one t x one, okay? And now I'm not treating alpha t just as a scalar, but it's a vector, right? That has two components, right? So I can imagine that Alpha is now the vector alpha zero, alpha one. And for example, you could put here alpha zero is one minus t and alpha one is t, right? And this is exactly the interpolant we had before, right? But, well, I should actually clarify this slightly. Okay, the point is, if you look at the velocity field that we had before, right? It's the time derivative of the interpolant taken in expectation conditional on xt equals x, right? Okay, but we can actually expand this out so that now we have this time derivative of alpha zero times the conditional expectation just over x for x zero plus alpha one dot times the conditional expectation of x one given x equals x. Okay, so there are these two terms, these two conditional expectations, and then these two time derivatives of this alpha vector, right? The realization is that all you need to learn to produce valid generative models are these conditional expectations. You don't actually need to learn specific parameterizations of alpha zero and alpha one to fulfill that paradigm. Indeed, you can actually choose them after the fact. So to use it in an ODE, you'd have to take some alpha that is now parametric in time to use this velocity field. But in reality, we just need to be able to sample over the whole space of where alpha zero and alpha one are defined. Right? to learn the velocity over that entire time. So we can ask ourselves, let's take a different limit on this and say we don't have alpha 0 and alpha 1, but we have alpha k, and we have k densities, right? And we can ask about an interpolant amongst the k densities. The minimal conditions on this are just that for this vector alpha, the sum of the independent uh, sum of the individual components of this vector alpha k squared need to be greater than zero 
And in practice, you know, you, you need them to be less than some radius, right? So that you can actually define a finite space over which you might want to um, learn the velocity field. So for example, this general condition is really saying you want to learn on or within the k-sphere of radius c, right, all the alphas. You could consider a more constrained problem where you say, um, for all the alpha k that I would have, right, I just, I want them to sum to one. And this would basically say alpha is a vector that's labeling a point on the simplex, okay? So imagine I had this four densities. Sounds, this sounds like a bad interpolant to me. Like if we now just learn everything, but it sounds very inefficient, um, right? We, I think we want to sort of more, if let's say we know that P0 uh, or P1 is sort of between P0 and P2, then we first want to go from P0 to P1 and then from P1 to P2 and not um, just learn everything. Well, I, there's two perspectives on that that I would say would be contrary to that. One is if you do this generically, now I have K choose two maps between K densities. Okay. So I can go from any of them to any of them by only learning K objects. Okay. The second point is it's very hard to know what it means for one density to be closer to another density in terms of the dynamics that you get from these sorts of transport problems. So you would need to have some measure that says that, as you say, row one is close to row zero and, uh, but, uh, and then row zero is far from row two. You know, row one is somewhere in between the two. That depends on very much on how you set up whatever it is the dynamic transport is that connects these two densities. And you don't know that a priori. But in fact, you know, one point that emerges from this is you might actually be able to learn a path amongst all the densities that finds a more optimal transport between any two marginals. So, so let, let me phrase a little bit more about like what the picture is in case other people are confused. But imagine I had four densities that I labeled row zero, row one, row two, and row three. Then if I choose an alpha such that for all alpha K, the alpha K sum to one, then some value of alpha defines some point on the simplex, right? Now I can sample the alpha on the simplex independent of time, right? So I can think about the question of defining an interpolant over this whole space without having to choose a time parameterization ahead of time. So let's hold on to that idea. To motivate this, maybe I should actually start with the next slide. I'll call this a barycentric interpolant, okay? This barycentric interpolant X alpha with alpha being this vector, that should be a, a K, not an L, uh, is somewhere on the simplex, delta K, is a stochastic process that is the sum alpha K times XK, okay? Where we have, just as before, a more multi-marginal coupling now, X1 through XK, right? That are drawn from this joint density row one, row of X1 through XK. And we can set any Gaussian density to be also on the simplex, right? that is drawn independently if you want a score function to run a gen generalized diffusion amongst the K densities. An important point is that this prob probability distribution of X alpha has a density rho alpha X, which satisfies K plus one continuity equations, okay? So now we're gonna introduce this generalized rho alpha, right? Which isn't a function of time anymore as we had before, but it's a function of all alpha, for which we have K sort of marginalized velocity fields, right, or k, k, which will be conditional expectations, for which, for all k, this continuity equation is solved, okay? Each gk is going to be given by the expected value of xk given x alpha equals x, okay? Once you have learned these gk, you can take any path on the simplex as a generative model to sample between any rho i and any rho j, okay? So we didn't parameterize in our statement of what these GK are, some path on the simplex, right? We didn't take an alpha of T, right? So the requirement is really just that at time T equals zero, we start at one of the marginals and at time T equals one, we end at a different marginal. And the generalized velocity field you get by this consideration 
is given by the time derivative of your parametric choice of alpha, either on the simplex or on the n sphere, k sphere, and these gk marginalized velocity fields like objects. And the probability flow is just the same, but you can now say, hmm, what is the best alpha k for me to take, even in the two marginal case, like they do in diffusion? So, you know, we know much effort goes into choosing an appropriate noise schedule for diffusions, right? What is the optimal set of sigma that they want to take in removing sigma t and removing the noise from images? Uh, this is this is sort of a what people investigate a lot. They call you know elucidating the design space, choosing different uh, signal to noise ratios. Uh, what I would want to stress here is that the multi-marginal framework here, where we're learning these conditional expectations. Uh, without choosing a time parameterization between any of the marginals, uh, now gives you a straightforward algorithm to geometrically choose a path. So we can say that the cost of these alpha, uh, cost of the transport with respect to alpha, right, for some parametric alpha hat, is just given by, as we had before, the norm of the velocity field squared taken in expectation over rho t. But we know that this norm, that this velocity field, now expands as a linear sum over the gk, right? So for all gk, we can have an alpha k hat, right? That are parametric functions for which after we've learned g, totally independent of g, we just want to minimize this function with respect to alpha. So, you know, for if alpha, I mean, if k equals 2, this is really just uh, 2 functions that need to be parametrically bounded at the, at the endpoints. You know, alpha zero uh, is some function, alpha one is some function that have to obey this simplex or this case here constraint, but we can parameterize them freely. And then we can just run some SGD or projected SGD to very quickly choose a performant alpha to do this task. So this is like a geometric way of choosing the sort of signal to noise schedule that you might have in diffusion. Okay. So, you know, this may this take- so this is now how you would optimize your alpha and um yeah can you exactly. say a little bit again so you optimize this before you train your flow is that right after in fact so the um the parametric choice of alpha has has no bearing on the learning of the gk so that it's sort of under the observation that uh, the objects you need to learn to learn some ODE or some, some dynamical transport are independent of the time parameterization you take on that space. So even in the two marginal case, say that this is the following simplex. It's a one simplex, it's just a line, right? You have the two endpoints. The two objects you need to learn are the expected value of x0, given x alpha equals x, and the spec expected value of x1, given x alpha equals x. But I can sample alpha however I want. When I go to generate, I need to choose a parametric form of alpha so that I can fulfill this continuity equation. In that case, I choose an alpha t after learning. And this could be something that I just choose to be, you know, in this case, again, it could be 1 minus t and t. Or I could let it be any parametric functions that satisfy the boundary conditions and just optimize those parameters. Okay. So in this case, for example, you know, people like this. Gaussian to checker example, you can parameterize the the alpha and learn them. You know, this takes about 20 seconds on a laptop because it's not a high, highly parametric problem, right? To find an alpha that gives you, you know, a lower path, a lower uh, path length than the one you would from just choosing a one minus TT, for example. Uh, so then the question oh. is, what if I have K densities? And now my simplex is much bigger, right? Because I've learned with more, more densities, right? Or the k sphere that you choose, k is larger, right? The space of paths is much larger, but I still want to maybe just generate from row zero to row one. Now I can take an even more complicated path that may, as you say, you might know that some densities you have are, are actually uh, useful in some way in changing the, the intermediate transport costs. You can now geometrically ask, what is the um, the alpha hat, right? That would give me that lower transport cost. This will not give you full optimal transport because we've restricted the question about minimal in W2 over velocity fields, which decompose linearly in alpha and G, right? 
So we said earlier to fully cover optimal transport, we need to have a nonlinear interpolant. This is explicitly a linear interpolant with respect to those parameters. Um, but it is a way to expand the class of, of paths and to geometrically learn one that, you know, is not about choosing a, a, an alpha or a beta in some sort of clever way uh, by heuristics. So I, I think I saw recently in one of the SC3 invariant papers that maybe Jason was the author of, or it might've been yours, Hans, where they said they couldn't use the, you know, linear interpolant uh, to do what they wanted to do, this might be a means of then, you know, and they chose some, some exponential decay factor on what they were doing. This might be a means to sort of geometrically discover what that, what that interpolant should be. Okay. Um, so you, this is, can I make an analogy to, um, yeah, can I make an analogy to kind of optimizing the schedule of, uh, in, yeah, that you use for inference? Yes. Optimizing the schedule. So the the schedule okay. there meaning can can you say it a little explicitly? Like in in our um our diffusion model schedule, if we train a uh, word to train um, a diffusion model exactly. with. Uh, okay. Um, so the the uh, point is you can independently of uh, choosing a schedule learn the objects you need to learn to realize the generative model. To make to instantiate the generative model, and then yeah, you could afterwards just geometrically under this this minimization choose the the schedule for the diffusion, mm, and this yeah, would give I... you the one that is least cost over all diffusions that have this linear decomposition. You know, a little bit. Um, so when I read your paper, right, I I thought like ah yeah, we have this alpha, um, this alpha can be huge or like. If we just let it be the whole simplex, then we're kind of learning a lot of useless, a lot of useless stuff. Uh, probably, if we have a problem with a certain structure, um, like let's say we have um, mm -hmm. like cells evolving from zero to one, and we have observations also at uh, zero point three, five, and seven. Um, and now, I thought we wanted to optimize the interpolant like before learning or also in the middle of learning a little bit. Um, oh yeah, you could do that, right? You could uh, train your vector field with your whole interpolant and then you can optimize the, the, um, the interpolant and then you, know, you can learn your flow model, your Gs with the whole... Mm -hmm. Uh, with all alphas and then you can optimize your alphas and then you can learn your G again and hope it gets better and then maybe this is more right. efficient. But but that would unfortunately put you in back into this max min algorithm that I was mentioning earlier. So if you learn with the alphas as part of the velocity field, right, by, by learning just this whole object rather than the decomposition with the Gs, then you have to do this max min again. The point here is that you can just learn these conditional expectations and then choose any alpha after the fact, uh, even if they are ones that need to be, you know, sequential as you say. It would be the set of alpha that allows you to do this sequential mapping. It would be like taking a path along the edge of the simplex with a set of alpha, that, um, or it may tell you that you need to go into the simplex and come back out to reach one of the one of the edge the endpoints. Um, but it, the, the purpose of it is basically to say that this is a very efficient, quick optimization. You know, it's maybe 20 parameters or something to just choose the alpha. There isn't that much leeway. And it gives you ones that are closer to the least cost way of doing this. Okay. Then let's, let's have you make your final points before you leave and I won't interrupt anymore. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the point, the motivation for this too is that, you know, there's this multi-marginal problem that people think about where they say, okay, if I have a bunch of densities and they all have, share some semantically meaningful information, right? How, how do I represent that sort of uh, row alpha X, right? That, that shares all that meaningful correspondence between the densities, okay? 
So, you know, a token example for this is if I have data from six hospitals, right, five or six hospitals that all have patient data with their own biases in them, right? We know that amongst all the different hospitals, there is a shared information about patient outcomes, but they're biased in, by different lurking variables, right? How can I construct a problem which, you know, represents the density that is invariant to those biases? Right. That's the motivation in some sense for some for some people's interest in this multi-marginal problem. There you need to choose a coupling, right, that associates all the points correctly. Here we say, forget the coupling, just choose. You can choose a coupling if you want in this paradigm, but even if you choose the independent coupling, what does the center of the simplex mean? What does the very centric center of the simplex actually tell us? You know, is there anything we can do with it? You know, I could take, for example, if I had a simplex that was six digits from MNIST and a Gaussian, I could take the same Gaussian value, right, and generate anywhere outward on the simplex to learn like a continuous correspondence between all the digits where these little dots represent the vertices of the simplex, right? I moved this Gaussian all the way to a four, I moved this Gaussian all the way to the three, two, but anywhere in between. There's also this more natural style transfer that emerges when you do something like this. This top row is just learning from the density of zeros to the density of threes, okay? For the same zero, right? You're gonna get some three, but that three might not have any meaningful correspondence with the structure of the zero you had, right? This is an example. Now you learn on just the edges of the simplex, you now get a three that comports to the actual shape of the original zero. And if you learn on the entire simplex, you get a three that sort of naturally emerges from the shape of the zero. Um, so there's a natural style transfer that comes from doing something like this. You know, empirically, this is what we observe. Theoretically, if you just learned on all the edges of the simplex, then all of these should be independent, all these little maps, and the top two rows should correspond. But by doing this weight sharing, there's some natural inductive bias that makes this emerge as so. If you sample from the very center, you, you know, you'd want to ask, if I pushed a sample like this three to the very center, and then I mapped it out, do I get a... Uh, other digit that shares likeness with the with the original pushed in digit. That's sort of the motivation for for thinking about the Barry center. You could do this on more high dimensional problems. So again, I have a Gaussian and then three entirely different data sets, right? This would be, you know, maybe row one is animal faces, row two is flowers, row three is the celeb HQ data set. I could marginally generate just as I would in a normal case any of these marginals from the Gaussian, right? Could sample these marginals. But I also can do these image to image translation tasks now. So for example, what is the wolf that corresponds to a flower, right? So I took a wolf face, you can push it to generate a flower. What about the cat corresponds to a flower, right? And you can see this natural style transfer that emerges, for example, you know, hair color, preservation of, uh, you know, characteristics, right? That, I mean, to me, this is a bit of a silly data set to do this on, but if you have something about this transfer that you know you want to maintain, this is sort of naturally baked into the simplex. Hmm. But yeah, that's the set of points I wanted to make. This is sort of a way of doing, you know, generation ODE or SDE between arbitrary densities. You can sort of consider more densities and in the process, elucidate a, a, a new perspective on the on the generation problem that you know has a, a new form of like Ramanian optimization over the or the space of it. And you can do this for however many densities you want. Very cool. I feel like you just threw a like a toolbox at us um, of so many different possibilities of things in painting, possibilities, conditioning possibilities multi-marginal possibilities that's yeah one has to well i would say it. i'm not sure what the nails are for many of the hammers current i mean for the multi-marginal i'd say i don't really know what what the perfect nail is but i thought you know at least there's some nice theoretical aspects of it that are worth sharing and for the conditional it seems nice to have some ways of of doing some of this stuff ah i forgot one thing because it's always important Oh. Here's a growing related work slide um, uh, that I tried to separate out into some of the different branches of this. Like there's all the Schrodinger bridge stuff we didn't talk about. Here's some citations for the simulation free flows, correlated couplings, 
if anyone is listening and their paper is not on here and they want it to be, please let me know and I will add it to my generic set of related works that I have when I talk to people about this stuff. Um, I will put this on a web page at some point that has um, related stuff. But of course, a lot of this is relevant and inspired by other people's work. So important that they get Very it. Nice. Very nice. Okay. Um, can you can you quickly go a few slides back so I can take a take a screenshot? Um, the more yeah, there we are. Uh, I I was confused this about one. yeah. I was confused thirty nine about the this thing on the right. Um, with the how is going from zero to three different to going from zero to three uh, in the like the second case, but um. Maybe we can discuss that at some other point, unless you uh, decide against against it. And yeah, we. I don't want no, no, to. Happily, just happy to discuss. This was um. Okay. Uh, I think an opaque way of describing this. I couldn't think of a better way, mostly because it's very hard to visualize the six simplex, um, and so I need to break this down a little bit better. Where there's. You know, I was trying to say here's there's just only one edge when you have a zero to three, but if you go back to this paradigm, there's actually many more edges. You could ask about a network that learns to generate from any of these, and then I card to just color it in to make it a whole simplex. But I agree that it's it's not very clear. I wasn't really sure of how to make it clear. Um, yeah, but what's the difference between line one and line two is that in line two you still start from a zero and you somehow sp uh, you use the vector field that goes to three but you learn not with the whole simplex but instead you only train uh... i only learn on the edge of the simplex so maybe i can put that what that looks like in the chat that means like so alpha here is is a length six vector the so seven because there's the gaussian component too right so for example, going from zero to three would look something like, well, there's, uh, let's say the, the first index is like this. That's one, two, three, zero, 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 right? That's yeah. the second row. The first row is only these guys exist, where this is zero to three, but it is row zero two row one. And then the last one is again, like the second, but it also learns on all yeah. values of alpha that satisfy the simplex. Okay, so I'm you still, still in, let me see if I, if I go back to this equation, this guy here, right? This is the velocity field that does the push forward. In, in the first row, um, well, there's only two alpha in B by definition. So there's the one alpha zero and there's the one alpha three. But you could just call them alpha zero and alpha one if you wanted to. There's only two of them. And I just learned yeah. directly that push forward. Then the second one is there, there is again, k equals six or seven of them. But I only learn the gk on values of alpha that are edges of the simplex. So it's like, uh, only values that uh, for which two of them are positive and the rest are zero. So for, you know, uh, in this case, if I go back to the chat, you learn across the whole simplex, but you learn, for example, only on cases where uh, this guy is positive and this guy is positive and all alpha K not equal for K not equal to zero three is equal to zero in the training. So the GK are only defined on the sim on the edges of the simplex. Yeah. Then the other case, I learn on the whole simplex. And is there an inductive bias that emerges from doing this or a data augmentation, right? From knowing about, you know, row alpha of X everywhere in the simplex that allows for this sort of more meaningful transfer to emerge. Okay, so let me make this statement and you see if it's wrong, right? If I, um, if for case zero and case one, um, for the 
row one and row two, if my model is perfectly trained, I would get the same, um, the same flow. Exactly. Right. For row, uh, row one and row two, or row one, sorry, uh, for all of these, ultimately, if you perfectly learn the GK, you should get the same, uh, velocity field. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm still confused why row one and row two are different. Like for row three, it's clear to me, but I, I would have thought that like during training with row one and row two, we always just see this same stuff because everything else is set to zero and, um, yeah, but uh, maybe but in the in the second in the second row, sometimes the GK do see different edges, right? So the the, the weights of the GK will sometimes see learning uh, uh, alpha that are on the one to four index, or the one to zero index, or the five to two uh, yeah. edge. Yeah, that's okay. the difference. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you for taking the time to listen. Sorry, can I maybe ask one last question about this? So if instead of a simplex uh, parameterization for your interplant, you use like a spherical uh, parameterization, mm -hmm. so essentially you moved uh, on a surface of a sphere, what would change uh, like practically for so, this interpolation? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, and, and maybe I can just motivate it by looking at the constraints here. So this constraint of the simplex is actually kind of strict, right? For alpha k to always sum to one, it's like um, that's a that's a harder constraint. It does make the learning problem easier, right? Because recall from uh, oh, potentially easier. R recall from the algorithm that we have to do. We have to minimize. Let me go back to things that look like this, right? where we have to sample over, in this case, it's just a time interval, but you would replace DT here with sampling over whatever the space of alphas, right? That you have defined is. So if this is on the simplex, then I need to evaluate this guy everywhere on the simplex. And that's actually a thing we know how to sample and it's constrained. If for example, this is the, the K sphere or the N sphere, then uh, silly animations, come on. You have to then, oh man, you then have to choose you then have to choose a constraint that still makes this like sampleable in some sense. So for example, if I took the radius of this thing to be too big or something, then uh, it might mean that like uh, evaluating the loss is a little bit more uh, high variance or something. But the benefit of working, for example, on the case sphere is that when you go to parameterize alpha to do something like this, right? Then there's actually fewer constraints on the par parameterization, right? So I have to choose some parameterization of alpha here, right? That maintains the simplex constraint. So if I wanted to potentially take a wonky path on the simplex where it goes in and out and blah, 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 because this is somehow a, a, a lower cost transport, uh, then I would want to have uh, a space for apps like the case here that's less restrictive, right? So I can have alpha that are actually more freely parameterized. Uh, and this is in some sense, maybe one of these trade-offs. So this is, you know, something we're thinking about now is like, what is actually the best set of, of alpha to take? Mm -hmm. so, so would it be fair to say that the training would be easier for the simplex, but maybe the inference is less effective in some sense, like more brittle? Uh, oh. I'm not sure it's brittle. I think it's more of a, it's, it's unclear really which is better in practice, but in either case, if you learn on the simplex, you, you can still straightforwardly generate from any of the marginals to any of the marginals. The learning is like, a, in that sense is, is not, uh, too difficult. It's just like really a, maybe your the ODE integrator you're using in the generation would prefer a slightly different uh, path, right, in the space of measures. So the the learning should still be straightforward. It just may take maybe a few more function evaluations or a few less function evaluations depending on your choice of alpha. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. 
there's a, there's one other point that's maybe worth saying is that the simplex allows you to say things more you know if you wanted to say something about multi marginally optimal transport and like choosing an optimal coupling uh, and the multi marginal problem which is generically very hard um, outside of like dimension two um, then uh, the simplex is sort of a natural object to make those considerations on. Yeah, okay, thank you. It was very clear. Thanks, Dennis. Hey, hey Michael, I uh, have some questions uh, regarding like uh, the, the, um, learning on the simplexes where you say that uh, there's a, a sort of style transfer. Um, when we look at the images, for example, if you go back to the images of the numbers, uh, and this is also something that uh, appeared like on, on the other slide where where you showed like the flower with the cat. Uh, what we see here is that like mostly when you go from left to right, you sort of have a superposition of the images uh, in, transparency, in transparency one on top of the other. And of course, like some of the things are transfer like the, the hair color uh, and like the shape of the tree was a bit more like a zero, but everywhere in between, like it's as if they, one image was taken, put 20% transparent, the other 80% transparent and put on top of each other. Um, and this doesn't right. seem to me like uh, asking the question, can you generate a cat that looks like a flower? Uh, so what is there like, why do you think it does that? And uh, yeah, how, how do you plan on like uh, improving on that in the future? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I think it's hard to say what is natural interpolation. There are things that look pictorially nice to us, but then we're talking about objects that are in extremely high dimension, right? And so there is a there's a bit of a discontinuity between like a coupling that we we get from doing this, or you know, a correspondence between the marginals and what looks like a natural correspondence to us. So, for example, in this cat image, where for like there's this little mark on its head that turns into the center of this flower, right? Um, it looks like an interpolation almost, right? But recall that this flower on the right does not exist in the data set, right? It's what's coming from the generative model. So it's a little different from, an, from any sense of interpolation, right? Because there isn't an endpoint to interpolate between, where this is the push forward of an ODE. Um, so that's a subtlety. But then there is the question of like designing the the intermediate density, right? So that you get something that corresponds to the sort of thing you're talking about. There's this paper by um, Ricky and uh, I can't remember who else because it just came out, but I heard Ricky talk about it because he came to NYU a few days ago where they ask about, you know, uh, doing some sort of generalized Schrodinger bridgey type thing, right? Where they're trying to directly uh, uh, define rho alpha X in a way that does this correspondence, sorry, not in the multi-marginal case, just in the normal way of doing this sort of stuff. Um, and I think there they get a little bit more of this natural transformation that you're thinking about. Um, okay. But I, it is I, an I, interesting I, question to ask, you know, how would you devise that for the interpolant? Yeah, so I, I understand what you mean. Uh, basically, like, uh, your method allows you to start from a cat instead of random noise and get a flower uh, from that cat via interpolation, and you don't really care about what happened in the middle. You just care about like the the end result, whether like having a a smoother function that looks at the interpolant in, in itself is a completely other objective, right? Yeah, I mean that's maybe one interpretation. Some folks might be like, I actually care a lot about the intermediate density, and then they might want to think about structuring it in some way. But naturally, here we were just asking what emerges on the simplex when you do this correspondence in some in some sense. Um, and I, I think, oh, someone just put it in the chat. But the paper that Lezu Lezwo just just uh, linked to this generalized Schrodinger bridge matching is the one I was thinking about. Okay, friends of the sun. For me, this definitely was very clarifying, as I said in the end, and it helped me a lot to uh, to pull together all these stochastic and turbulence works and also to gain a bit of a bit of a better uh, perspective on all the other uh, flow matching works and the rectified flows yeah we, we didn't talk so much about rectified flow stuff here but there are many connections happened here 
And uh, if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to Michael. I think um, the stochastic and turbulence perspective is, is pretty cool as well. Yeah, and with that, if you want to join the other sessions, all the information is in the description. And see you guys next week, any week. Bye.